So I have a daughter, she's five, and a couple years ago, when she was about three, she was learning to count. And she already knew how to do like one, two, three. She could count out loud, but I mean she was learning to count objects, which is a little more complicated. And one of the cool things about having a daughter or a kid is that they are beginners at everything. And I love watching beginners learn something that I already know. Like I'm pretty good at counting. I, I make it look easy. <laughs> but it's not easy. And um, just watching my daughter, I could see how many ways there were to fail, that it was a real process that you had to get right. And I like going down into these basics and these fundamentals and really uncovering something that to me is, has, I've done it so long, it's so intuitive, I can't, I don't have access to it anymore. But when I watch her, I have access again. And I can say, oh, I see what I do when I count because of the way she messes up, basically. So let's go over this process of counting. So let's say we have some rocks, and I line them up so it's easier to count. Um, and so here's the process. You get into a rhythm and you say one, two, three. Okay. At the same time, each time you say a word, you touch a rock. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six. And then when you've touched all the rocks, the last number you say, the last word you say, is the count of the rocks. As long as you do it right, you don't skip any and you don't do any twice. So that's cool. We have a process for turning some real world thing, a, a collection of objects, into data, into a number. And then we can use that number in other ways. And I feel like this is really fundamental to what we do as programmers, that we're, we're always dealing with processes and often we generate data off of that process. And just to go deeper into this mystery, uh, let's, um, let's see like if we project it out 10 years. And she starts collecting tons of rocks, tons, a lot of rocks every day, more than she does now. Because the trend continued. She's, at the end of her day, she empties her pockets, her bags, she puts them on a table, and she counts them. And then every day, she just records some information about the day, the date, you know, the weather, and how many rocks she collected. And then at the end of the year, she can do all sorts of cool stuff with this data. She can sum up how many rocks did I collect this year? What was the average number of rocks per day? What was my biggest week? What was my smallest month? She can do all of this stuff. For instance, the number of rocks in the year. She can do that without ever touching the rocks again. And we trust, we all of us in this room trust that if she counted them each day correctly and wrote them down correctly, when she adds them all up, she would get exactly the same answer as if she took those rocks that she put in the closet for the year and counted them out with that same process she started with. And to me, that's like very mysterious. She's not touching rocks anymore, but she's talking about, she's discovering stuff about the rocks. She somehow modeled some important aspect of the rocks with this data that she's collecting. And so that's something we do as, as programmers, is we, we take some real world process and we turn it into some other process that a computer runs, instructions in a machine. And these processes somehow get the same result, the same answer, somehow. They're, two, they're totally different processes. One is bits in the machine, it's moving stuff around in memory, and the other is manipulating physical objects. So when we translate one process to another, there must be something that is preserved, something essential to that process that goes from the physical process to the, um, to the uh, software process. So what is it that makes numbers, as an example, so useful for counting piles of rocks? That's the question I'm trying to answer. So the title of my talk is All I Needed for FP I Learned in High School Algebra. It's kind of a fib because, like I've already shown, a lot of the stuff we do in FP, we started learning as soon as we were born. Right? We were playing with little things as babies. 
we, we develop these intuitive understandings of number and stuff like that. Except in high school, we started going symbolic, right? When algebra class, that's when arithmetic was no longer just some markings for problems we had to do in arithmetic, right? Just adding numbers. It became talking about the properties of these, these um, operators that we had. My name is Eric Normand. Um, I teach closure online, in video form mostly, at purelyfunctional.tv. I also have a newsletter, a weekly newsletter. It's free. Sign up. I talk about closure and functional programming. It's a mix of news and history and other cool stuff I find around on the internet. Uh, and I'm also running a conference in New Orleans called Closure Sync. It's in February. Um, Y'all know Strange Loop. Um, if Strange Loop is about the confluence of industry and academia, Closure Sync is about software and its place in the history of humanity. And I feel like the Closure community, through the lens of Closure, because the Closure community is, uh, I think, a really cool community to talk about this stuff in. Right? We, we are obviously philosophical programmers. OK, so like I said, I like going basic. Please don't think I'm talking down to you or like, I don't think you know how to count or something like that. Um, I love doing this. I do it myself with my daughter's rocks with her. You know, I don't do it by myself. <laughs> I do it myself, not by myself. OK, so let's imagine we had a pile of rocks. We'll call it A. And we add to that another pile of rocks, and that's B. And we get this bigger pile of rocks. We can call that A plus B. Now, we could also go the other way. We could start with the small one, B, and add the bigger one on top and pile of rocks at the end. At least the structure is, is different, like the pile is different, like the arrangement of rocks. But the count is the same, right? And we learn this as, as kids. And there's something about this where the, the, for combining rocks, order doesn't matter. We need to preserve this when we translate it into our information system, into our logbook. We need to preserve this order doesn't matter. Because we, we want to be able to, you know, we can add up from the bottom, we can add up from the top. It's all the same, right? We know that. Um, so let's, let's move into the symbolic realm. Here's some closure code. Um, we can also write this. And we want to say that these are the same, so we can put in equals. So we've just derived this property of addition uh, that the order of the arguments doesn't matter. And then we can pull this algebra trick and say, we can actually say this about any function that we want to write. We could say, hey, it has this property. Our order of arguments doesn't matter. And mathematicians have called this commutativity. Order doesn't matter. And what, the reason I'm bringing this up is commutativity is a great property. Mathematicians have been talking about it for a long time. But we just derived it really quickly. And we can derive all sorts of properties that we want. These are this is just one that mathematicians happen to have already discovered. But in your domain, the one you're modeling in your software, you have to go in and like figure out what are the things that are important to keep. Um, another thing that's cool about this is, starting from the formula or the, the equality that we have, uh, we can make a test check property really easily. So, of course, the generator has to be right. Uh, but if we got that all right, we've got a test check property that we can now guarantee that our function f is commutative using test check. OK, now, I was going to say this to the end, but Rich talked about this in the morning, so I have to mention it. So I am not trying to say that, that um, math is like the perfect thing and we should all be programming more math. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that math is this platonic world where everything is consistent. That's like how you derive more math. You just stay consistent, you can do whatever you want. But in the real world, we, and we're modeling real world processes, it's, it's much more messy. We don't have this strict line between what is commutative and what isn't. Sometimes the line is blurry, sometimes there's conditions on it. Here's an example. If we have merge of two hash maps, 
I could say, and I'd be wrong, but I'd, I could say it's commutative. It's not commutative because what if you have key collisions between the two maps? One of them's going to have to win, right? But when I'm programming in Clojure, and this is true in most dynamic languages, I know at this point in my program, A actually is a map from over here, and B is a map from over here. I know the keys, and they don't collide, right? That's how we program. We, we keep this stuff in our heads as we're programming. So if I just change the generators and I say, well, if, I gen if A is a map 1 and B is a map 2, I can now say that they are, because they have different keys, that it's commutative. So I'm, I'm just like elaborating this kind of absolute property called commutivity, commutativity, and tweaking it a little just for my purposes, because that's how my model works. So we're taking the idea from math, but making it much more real world applicable. All right. Now, I said before that at the end of the year, my daughter would like add up all the weeks, right? She would figure out how, much, how many rocks she had per week, how many rocks she had per month. And that's cool. She can group them by week. She can group them by month. She can group them by the whole year. She can say, well, how about each day? Was Monday bigger in general than Tuesday, than Wednesday? She can group them arbitrarily. That is a cool property that comes straight out of piles of rocks. That's something that got preserved. So let's take a look at that. So we have these piles of rocks. We have two choices. We can group the ones on the left first and then add in the other one. Or we can start with the ones on the right and add in the third one. There's also the third choice, which is just put them all together at once, which is what we do in Clojure, right? We just have a plus with a bunch of numbers because we don't like to write extra parentheses in Lisp. And what this means is grouping doesn't matter. I can group by month, I can group by week. Grouping doesn't matter. Just to derive this, um, I can group there by the first one or the left ones or the right ones, and then I can put the other ones around it, and then I can get rid of the white space, and then I can say they're equal. So we just derived this little property that we can now use in test check or you know, just keep it in our head, make a comment, something like that. And then we can say for any function, not just for addition. This is called associativity. And it's another one of those properties that algebraists talk about. It means grouping doesn't matter. Okay, let's go deeper into this one because associativity is actually a really cool property that's, that's, it's not evident from what I've talked about, like how cool it is. So I'm talking about types, but I'm not being, I'm dynamic typing, right? We're closure people, but dynamic typing, just like valid values for the arguments. So we see if we look at the first argument, we've got the return value of F is the first argument to F and A is the first argument to F which means that they have to be the same type. Same here, C is the second argument, and F, the return value of F is also the second argument. So what we're saying is the return value of F and the two arguments to F have to be the same type. Now, I like to think of this as, as whole values. Uh, this is an idea from John Hughes, and this is how I, this is how I think about it. If we have two piles, we combine them into a new pile. So it has all the same operations, the same properties as the, the individual piles had. Or if we have two strings and we, or two lists and we concatenate them, we have a new list, right? We haven't changed types. Same with merging two hash maps. Merge two hash maps, you have a new hash map. We're, we're maintaining the space we're in. We're still using the same type. These two often get confused in high school algebra. I got confused. I still use the words interchangeably and wrong. Um, I think it's because my teacher, and also just now me, we both used uh, addition as the example, which is both associative and commutative, so it's easy to mix them up. But it's clear to see that the formulas are very different, um, and um, one's about order and one's about grouping. 
Now, I've talked about some associative operations that aren't commutative, like string concatenation or list concatenation. You can't reverse the order of the strings and get the same answer. But you can group them differently. I can do the ones on the right and then the one on the front, or the ones on the left and the one on the right. OK. But it's very hard to find a basic mathematical operation that is commutative but not associative. But you can make one. You just compose stuff up. And so here's an example, average. So we can see it's, if we're averaging two numbers, it doesn't matter what order we put A and B in, right? But it's not associative. So let's look at the order that it doesn't matter. Just as an example, if we average 10 and 4, we get 7. If we average 4 and 7, or 4 and 10, we get 7. Same answer. But if we do grouping, so we add a third number, C, it's going to get tangled up with arrows here. But so we have A and B, 10 and 4, we get 7. And then we average in that in with 6, we get 6.5. Or we could go on the second line, we can do 4 and 6, we get 5. Then we average 10 in with that, and we get 7.5. So these are different. So it's the order, I mean, the grouping does matter. The order doesn't matter. But I want grouping to not matter. So we saw before how we could take a property that we discovered in the world and turn and, and translate it and make sure it's preserved into our software. But we can do this other thing where we take a software that doesn't actually have the property that we want and add it in. We can, we can just do it. We can just put it in there. So we, we want it to be able to be associative, so let's do that. Okay. I often like to look at um, imperative code because the answers are often in there. Because if it works, it must have the properties that we're looking at. It's just that the properties are like smeared all over the boilerplate. So here we have a function average where you have um, an array of numbers, and you, have, you initialize some variables. And uh, then we loop through the numbers, and we accumulate the values into our variables. Then at the end, we divide. And we have this kind of case where if it's 0, we don't know what to return. So here I'm returning null. That doesn't matter right now. I want to show this part. This is what we should focus on, is that at each iteration through the loop, we have a complete number and count for the things we've already seen. Right? We, and we're grouping them like from the left of the array one at a time. Uh, because we're associative, we can do that. We can group that addition any way we want. But the thing is, we've separated them. We don't have that whole value property. We have a sum in one number and a count in another. So let's put them back together. Let's define a function called combine. Um, and it's got to take two, it's, we want it to be associative, so it's got to take two arguments. And so we'll take those sum and count, and we'll tuple them up. So I'm going to call that tuple of a sum and a count an average. It's a ratio. It's the numerator and the denominator of the average. We just haven't divided them yet. We're just keeping them separate. And so we also know that the return value has to be that same type. And how do we get it? Well, we know we're adding up. Before we were grouping from the left. Now we're grouping arbitrarily. So we're just going to sum up the sums and sum up the counts. OK, now we can create a function called toAverage, which is going to take a number and turn it into an average. And so a single number, the average, you know, the denominator would be 1. So we just derive that as tuple of number and it's n and 1. And then we can write a function called average, which takes that list of numbers and it uh, maps two average over them, and then it can just reduce combine on them. OK, now we have a problem that we, what do we do in the, if numbers is empty, it's an empty list? I don't recommend using the two argument version of reduce. We need a, an initial value there. So we're asking the question, where do we start? Where do you start a computation? What do you, like, 
if, I'm, if I tell you, here's some rocks, put them into a pile, where do you start? You start with like a space on the floor and you call it an empty pile. And then you start adding the rocks to it, right? Or if I say, here's some rocks, count them, where do you start? We're programmers, so we start at zero. That's what you would initialize your thing to, and then you just add one, add one, add one. So we have this thing in addition where we know we're starting at zero, so we know that adding zero to A will give us A. And in general, we could, we could do the algebra trick, swap out the plus for any variable, and we can say that F of A and I, which corresponds to the F, so I put a subscript, even though that's not closure, but um, that I corresponds to the function itself, right? Like each function might have a different value of I. And so we can call this an identity value. So in addition, the identi in, uh, identity value is zero. In uh, list concatenation, it's the empty list, et cetera. And it just says where to start has a very simple formula. And uh, now we know what to put there. We go back to our JavaScript code and we see, hey, that's what we initialized our values to. That's where we started at 0, 0. And so we'll just put that in there. Now we're not dividing them, so this is OK. It is a ratio of 0 and 0, but we have not actually divided them. But what we have now, which we didn't have before, was an answer to the question of what is an empty average, an average of zero numbers. We have a value that we can check. Is this the empty value? Because before we had null, which doesn't really work with numbers. You're, like, you're probably going to do some other math with that null, and you're going to get a null pointer exception. So you haven't really solved the problem. And if you return zero, which I've done before too, you confound it with the actual average zero. So you don't know if you have nothing or not. So there, we have something now. All right. Monoids. Monoids are where it's at. I don't know why everyone's talking about monads all the time. But monoids are where it's at. And we just made one. It's any operation that has, is associative and has an identity value. That's all a monoid is. And they're way more useful, m way more common than mo uh, monads. And they're, w they're awesome for functional programming. Uh, and we should be talking about monoids. Maybe we don't need to use the name, but you know, there. It's there. OK, here's the table with everything we've learned so far. All right, here's another property that is so basic, like it's even silly to talk about. But like, let's say I'm hungry and I don't want to cook. I go into a restaurant, I get my food, I eat it, and then I leave. Right? I'm glad I can leave. I don't want to live there. I just want to eat. I want to read a book. So I go to the library. I read the book, and I leave. I don't want to live in the library. I want to come back out. I want to go up to the top of the mountain, come back down. I want to get dressed and get undressed. There's operations in the world that we want to preserve that we can go back and forth on, because going back and forth matters. We want to be able to move into a space where the, some calculation is possible or way easier and then come back out, because that's not where we want the answer. We don't want the answer in that space. When I say space, I mean like type, right? So going back and forth matters. Here's an example. Um, Rich actually talked about this. I think he saw my slides, which is why his talk was so good. OK, so um, we have some value at the bottom left, some map with my name and uh, birthday. We need to send it to another computer to do some work. So we print it to a string, and now that it's a string, we can, sear, we can send it over the wire. Couldn't do that as just a regular data structure. And then he, can't, he, he doesn't want a string. He wants a data structure on the other side. So they read it in, and now it's a data structure. You can operate on it, do other stuff. And then you can do the reverse for the answer. Right? That's awesome. It's awesome that we can do this. And so just symbolically, we can kind of derive this. So we have print string A, and then we read that. That should be equal to A. Right? This is a really cool property. And we can do the algebra trick and say F of A 
and g of that is equal to a. And in that case, we say g is the inverse of f. And what it means is going back and forth matters. So this is another property that you can derive from your code. You can turn into test check properties. You can add it to your software. And now we can add it to this. So we already have a way of taking a number and moving it into this space where it's an average. It's a ratio. We need to be able to come back down. So we can write a function called average2, which takes that tuple, the sum and the count, and divides them. Right? And then our average function just becomes this really clear step-by-step -step thing. Take some numbers, lift them all up into the average space, reduce with combine, and then lower it back down. And this is a very common functional programming pattern. OK. Elevator buttons. Who knows what property I'm going to talk about now? Um, so you walk into an elevator area, you press the button, and then someone else comes in. Button's still lit up. They come and press it too. Did they need to do that? No. But we have the habit, or we have the like irresistible urge to press that button, even though it's already pressed. But it doesn't matter. That that second press did not matter. In general, we could say duplicates don't matter for some operations. So here's another operation where duplicates don't matter. Start with a hash map M. We associate the key A and hello. And then we do it again. We know that that's the same. Oops. That's the same as doing it once. And it even looks funny. Like, why would you even think of writing this and doing this? Well, I think you're seeing it backwards if you're asking that. Because it's more like, I want to be able to do that and not worry about it. I don't have to care. I can do it as many times as I want, and it's the same as doing it once. So we can do the algebra trick again. We can say we know f of a is equal to f of a, but then we can go, boom, do it again, still equal. This is called idempotence. Probably guessed that, because we talk about that as programmers. It's like the one algebraic property we're not afraid to name. Um, and it just means duplicates don't matter. OK, so let's say we want to implement this. We want to implement an uh, elevator button system for like the whole hotel. And we want to maintain this idempotence property. So all we have to do is use an operation that already has idempotence. And we're done. So a soj on a hash map has that. So we put in an atom because it's mutable. And then we can define a function called press. Now, here's the thing. It takes a button ID. When you're using idempotence, often you have an identity. So the, the value has some kind of identity. If you're adding to a set, so you add this, the number four to a set twice, the second time doesn't matter, right? What is the identity? It's itself, right? Four is its identity. But when you're adding to a hash map, what is the identity? It's, it's the key, right? The key is the identity. Um, so we're going to use that button ID as the key to a soch, and we'll just put true. It doesn't really matter what we put in there. And we do some code later on. We get a press, and we, we identify the button by its location and the direction it's pointing. So the third floor, north side, up button. And you could press it multiple times, and we have this intuitive no a notion that that second and third time doesn't matter, because we're going to get the same state. So we're done with idempotence. Um, there's more properties that I would love to talk about, but um, every time I ran through this, it got complicated to explain, and I ran out of time. And I didn't get to conclude and talk about the good stuff. But just quickly, a zero value. When you're multiplying, if you get a zero, you can stop, because you know the answer already. You have a zero. So that's a zero value. So it tells you when to stop. Um, and then structure preservation is this cool thing. If you're in a factory and you have someone doing two operations on, a, on an object, it's an assembly line, right? As a manager, you can go in and say, hey, wait a second. Let's see if it's more efficient to split that two tasks into two people doing it, one after the other. 
So it's the same assembly line, but now you've split that one task over. But we know we'll get the same product out at the end. That's structure preservation. Um, and so there's the formula for that right there. OK, here's the conclusions. Um, translating these properties is what allows us to program, to translate from a physical to a software or symbolic system. And not only do we want to preserve these things, and they're not these specifically. These were just examples, right? Like I talked about that. You can derive your own. You can add these to get those properties, just like we did with the average example. And you can discover your own properties. The, the trick is to make sure that they're simple and easy to test like we had. Um, and you can tweak the ones that, that are well known, that you find in the algebra books. Um, because in the real world, there are these like corner cases and stuff that you have to deal with. All right, here's another thing. Here are some challenges of distributed systems that you know, we all face when we start spreading our work over multiple machines. Messages are delivered out of order. Well, if we just had something where order doesn't matter, that's OK. Messages are delivered one or more times. Well, if we just had something where duplicates didn't matter, now that's OK. Sending tasks and combining answers. Well, if we had everything we needed for the task to, to be done bundled together in a whole value, we could just send it. And then we know that however it gets grouped in the Hadoop cluster and like recombined, it's OK, because we can combine it back together and get the same answer. Where do you start? when you're starting some work, when you start at the identity value. And then serialization, deserialization. Um, we need to be able to turn it into something that we can send and then turn it back into data we can use. OK, I talked about this. Algebraic properties make great test check properties. I think I already mentioned this. Right, so we can test, as an example, the, uh, the commutative property of multiplication really easily. It's, it's, it's just this. It's great. I love test check. And people always wonder, like, well, where, how do you figure out what properties to actually test? Well, you just come up with this little identity, this little equality, and there you are. You have something to test, something from the, um, the, the thing you're modeling. OK, that's it. It's my talk. Oh, um, I forgot something, one thing before you walk out. I wanted to thank Guy Steele, because a lot of these ideas come straight from him. He's sitting in the back. Thank you. Thank you.